It's Friday and we are back here on Breakfast Central to bring to you the latest stories every morning. We are your morning companion. It feels good to be here. Having been here through uh, Monday, yes, all the way from Monday up until today, which is Friday, uh, it's the Weekend Starter Edition. And on the Weekend Starter Edition, well, nothing really has changed. The sad stories uh, coming out of uh, the northern part of Nigeria, kidnappings again. Chikun local government area indeed saw another kidnap. Uh, we do recall last year it was uh, very, very disastrous for that local government area in Kaduna State. And it happened all over again. Seems like it's repetitive. Well, aside that, we also saw President Volame Tilivu um, taking some strong decisions yesterday as well. Well, if you're a lover of uh, the arts, uh, a lot of things did take place yesterday. But for us here at Breakfast Central, our duty and our job is to make sure that we look at the big stories and talk about them like we would always do. Of course, bring in the guests, uh, be it the experts, be it the analysts, analysis as well, and uh, uh, make sure that we dissect these issues one take at a time. I'm Joe Hansen saying good morning to you. Hoping you had a great night. Joining me as well is Adibola Adidubba. Ekara Adibola. <laughs> ah, good morning, Joe. Bonjour. <laughs> well, today is uh, International Women's Day, so right, happy. So I, I was going to leave that for you. You know, to I'm in the color code pink. We I can celebrate, see. I can see <laughs> you that. know, uh, International Women's Day, and the theme for this year is to you know uh, invest in women as well as accelerate progress. Now, talking about the issues in Nigeria, I can't help but agree with you, Joe. I mean, it's one issue too many, particularly mm. for the northern area. Uh, you talked about Kaduna again, resurfacing in the news as uh, terrorist attacks. Mm -hmm. You know, bandits abducting about 280 pupils from schools. Um, I mean, this story breaks my heart. Uh, this week alone, we have seen abduction of people, uh, of people in uh, Boronu State. Uh, now we're having the same again in Kaduna State. I, I don't know really, uh, when it comes to our security, I think a lot still needs to be done. Uh, I just hope the government and those, you know, at the helms of affairs in terms of security of Nigeria will step up their game and ensure we nip this menace in the bud once and for all. I agree with you. It's a lot of work, a whole lot of work, uh, because uh, it has to do with the porous borders, which happens to be the first point of call. I mean, we've brought in experts here on Breakfast Central and on News Central in our subsequent news bulletins and the likes, and experts have been able to tinker with the idea of uh, more of a collaboration to ensure that insecurity is uh, taken out of our conversations and indeed people can live happily. It's sad to know that the North was a place where you would always, I mean, I've been to the North once, particularly in Joss, although I didn't go there because of a good reason. I did go there for a sad reason. But then again, I was inspired to see oh. how the mountainous regions and the, the weather itself, the beautiful people, and then you wonder what is really going on. But then again, it's not far-fetched. Uh, the Sahel, of course, the uh, uh, African continent is okay. faced with um, a lot of these challenges here and there. Not just Nigeria. We've seen these things take place in different parts of uh, the world. Most importantly, in Africa here that we are focused on. Uh, we've seen countries like Mali, Guinea, Burkina Faso, uh, within the West African region. And of course, the northern part of Africa as well is faced with its own insecurity. Uh, but then again... We, we just hope that Nigeria in particular, hopefully uh, the chief of army staff and um, the, the security operators will be able to meet together, see what they can do to mitigate uh, the uh, challenges of insecurity. Well, hopefully they had a meeting with the Senate to outline their plans when it comes to tackling uh, insecurity in Nigeria, you know, the program they have, you know, in pipeline as to ways and means to help nip this issue of, you know, uh, insecurity, kidnapping, uh, banditry, abduction, you know, in the bird. I feel it's one too many. It's gone on, it's, it, I mean, it's been going on for so far, for, so, for far too long. Um, if it's political will that's needed, I just feel that should be endorsed or put in place in full gear. Uh, if it's the security apparatus we need, I feel investment should be made in terms of, you know, uh, purchasing, it's, you know, uh, up-to-date equipment or mm. security apparatus to help tackle these issues of uh, uh, insecurity and bandit banditry you know, we have in, uh, in wow. Nigeria. We we'll just, we'll just keep our fingers crossed, hoping that the over 200, we hear 280, some 280. say 220, some say 300. So there isn't really a specific um, uh, number that we can hold on to. But of course, 
uh, we will uh, ensure that we do have our eyes and ears there in Kaduna. Um, hopefully, if, the, if, we are, if they can join us early this morning, it will be nice so we can hear what the situation report is. But then again, we also hope that the families can mm. indeed cope with this sad situation. It's so sad that people are being kidnapped mm. when the economic situation isn't fair at all, where people cannot feed, and yet they have to also contend with um, insurgency, being mm. kidnapped. Um, so it's like you're, you're catering to your, to your mm -hmm. loved one, your family, your home, and then you're also trying to dodge and fight against the terrorists who would come to attack you. So uh, there's a lot. There's a lot that's yeah. really going on. But then again, I'm sure you have all of these covered uh, on the headline news this morning here on Breakfast Central. So Debola will join you pretty soon. And need I announce that we also have uh, another anchor who will be joining me this morning. No, it's not Oliver Modi. Nah, it's not. You get to find out, all right? But first, let me bring to you the headlines for a Friday morning. Celebrating International Women's Day is one thing that we would do and you know what the theme is. We're looking at uh, getting that support for the women. Bandits invade Kaduna school, kidnap pupils. Well, it was rumoured that they were many and we'll find out what. We'll also look at Nigeria's financial policies. We'll also look at the CBN, the situation that took place yesterday in court and the likes. Newspaper front pages will also be here for 8am where you can be part of it as we analyse some of the big stories on the front pages as well. And then we'll let you in on every single thing that you need to know all here on Breakfast Central. Hello and welcome to Breakfast at Lines here on New Central TV. I am Adebola Adeduba. Uh, let's begin in Nigeria where the president, Bola Chinobo, has suspended the managing director, chief executive officer of the Rural Electrification Agency, Hamad Salihijo, alongside three executive directors of the agency indefinitely. And this is according to a statement signed by Chinobu's special advisor on media and publicity, Ajiri Ngalale, on Thursday. Tinobu also ordered a wider investigation into the conduct of the officials in a fraudulent mis-expenditure amounting to over 1.2 billion naira over the past two years. The president appointed a new management team of the agency who is serving acting capacity with immediate effect. They include Abba Aliyu as managing director, CEO Ayuade Boyega as executive director, corporate services, Umaru Umaru as Executive Director, Technical Services, Doris Ubo as Executive Director, Rural Electrification Fund, and Olufemi Akinyeluri as the Head of Project Management Unit, Nigeria Electrification Project. Five of the abducted persons in the fresh attack by Boko Haram terrorists in Brunei State have just escaped from captivity. The attack happened on Monday when the insurgents struck three internally displaced persons camps in Ngala town, the headquarters of Gamburu, Ngala local government area of the border of Cameroon, where the terrorists are most active. According to a security source, the victims, over 40 girls and women, went to fetch firewood from the bush when the insurgent wicks them away from the Baban, Sansani camp, Zulum camp and Arabic camp. The Nigeria Labour Congress has demanded 794,000 as the new national minimum wage for workers in the Southwest geopolitical zone. The Labour Union in the Southwest, through the chairperson of the Lagos State Chapter of the NLC, Fumi Sassi, made a demand during her presentation at the ongoing public hearing of the Tripartite Committee on National Minimum Wage in Ikeja, Lagos on Thursday. Sassi notes that the demand was jointly agreed on by all the members of the union in the Southwest. President Bola Chinebu, through the Vice President Kashim Shetima, inaugurated a 37-member panel on the new minimum wage in the Council Chamber of the State House in Abuja on January 30th, 2024. The Army Chiefs of Military Ruled Niger, Mali and Burkina Faso have announced the creation of a joint force to battle long-running militant rebellions raging in their countries. According to Niger's army, Chief Mausa Salao Bamao in a statement, the new force will be operational as soon as possible to take into account the security challenges in their space. He asked that they are convinced that with the combined efforts of the three countries, they will manage to create the conditions for shared security. The size of the joint force was unspecified, but Bamao said the three armies had agreed to develop an operational concept that would allow them to reach their defense and security ob objectives.
Nous sommes parvenus à élaborer un concept opérationnel permettant d'atteindre les objectifs en matière de défense et de sécurité. Ainsi, nous sommes arrivés à concevoir une force conjointe des pays de l'AUS qui sera opérationnelle dans les plus brefs délais pour prendre en compte les défis sécuritaires dans notre espace. Nous sommes convaincus qu'avec les efforts conjugués de nos trois pays, nous parviendrons à créer les conditions d'une sécurité partagée. Un objectif au centre des préoccupations de nos États et de nos vaillantes populations. It is International Women's Day today. Yes, it's time to reflect on the progress made towards women uh, when it comes to development, opportunity, gender equality, as well as honor the incredible contributions of women in our society. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines. It's back to Joe. Right, so it's back to me, most importantly. And I can say at this juncture, I can bring in our anchor for this morning anyway. Well, uh, you did talk about uh, International Women's Day, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about that in between. We do have um, our correspondent, uh, Chinwe. She'll be joining us. Uh, yesterday, she did file a report where uh, the governor's wives and, of course, uh, some prominent persons came together to see what they can do for women. Uh, we'll get to find out what it really is. But before you go, Adibola, just one quick question. What does Women's Day mean especially for you what's the significance for you every year year in year out well like the theme you know spells out it's a call to invest in women as well as accelerate progress for women in nigeria in africa and also the world in general so for me uh it's a day to mark to honor to celebrate women folk in terms of their contributions to development in the society and also a need to give women much more representation in public offices or any field they find themselves. Mm. Well said, spot on. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at night. It's good to be here. All right. Okay, so um, in line with that, I'm going to quickly just, um, you know, switch my gears and, of course, uh, bring in our uh, morning anchor who joins us this morning. Just for today, by the way. How are you doing? <laughs> it's been about a year, and it's so good to be back on this set because <laughs> I've, I've missed breakfast show, to be honest. Really? Are you, are you sure about that? And not like I want to be here every day, uh, but uh, you see, you see <laughs> I, I miss day. being a, a, a special guest, a special, a special uh -uh. appearance on Tell the show. Them. Yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, you can always catch blessings with Sugo and Jeff Theory. Um, of course. She, uh, Lolo. Tolu, um, Catherine. Tolu, Catherine. And sometimes they have um, some guests who possibly tear the roof down, <laughs> you know, here and there. Yes. But, but it's great to have you this morning. And we do have very, very important discussions that we're going to look at. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, around the current happenings in Nigeria and, of course, the current situation. Uh, I have a lot of questions I'd like to ask blessings in between. But one of it is, how are you coping with the fuel situation, the light or power situation as well from your end i'm not coping okay i think that's the answer You're pulling through. <laughs> i think that everybody is trying to cope but mm. we're finding it hard too but i mean we try to be optimists so we say that the situation will not affect us even if it is but yeah we hope it won't oh, all right anyway we'll go for a quick break when we come back we'll go straight to our top stories the first hour is open for you to be part of so uh, why don't you check through um, that uh, post and see what our socials are and then you can interact with us online and we're also streaming on YouTube, Facebook and not forgetting to on Instagram. Oh wow, yes we are. We'll go for that quick break. Stay with us. Breakfast Central continues in a moment. Thanks for staying with us on Breakfast Central. And it is such a wonderful day because it is International Women's Day today. And it's a time to reflect on the progress that has been made towards gender equality and honor the incredible contributions of women around the globe. Today is a day dedicated to celebrating the strength, the resilience, and the brilliance of women all around the world. We've talked about the fact that it's not just people that you see women differently. Women need to see themselves differently and act accordingly. So once again, happy International Women's Day to all women out there. Uh, before we go into the conversation, uh, we have this package from New Central's Chinwe Ugele. Take a look. Speaker, Dr. Chema Ibezim and guest lecturers in their separate presentations enunciated the power of women and how they can rally help for fellow women. When God blesses you, 
with female children, he loves him so much. This year's campaign theme underscores the crucial role of inclusion in achieving gender equality. It calls for action to break down barriers, challenge stereotypes, inspire, and create environments where all women are valued and respected. It is the opinion of the wife of Governor Alex Oti, Priscilla, and some other women that investing in women takes care of so many societal problems. Despite our progress, we cannot afford to be complacent. We must remain vigilant in our efforts to address all the systemic challenges that continue to impede the advancement of women. If you start talking gender by gender based violence, like I said, promoting women economic empowerment and ensuring access for comprehensive health care services for women and girls. The moment Nigeria realizes that a woman is a nation builder, then and includes women in all aspects of economy, in nation building, then things will begin to mend. The need for women themselves to become the change they desperately desire from the opposite sex also came to the fore. Why we invest in women economically? I want to charge us to support one another, especially in this time that the country is in a challenging time. The moment women begin to support themselves, things will begin to go well. Because if you look at the population, women are more in the population even than men. We are important in all ramifications. They are not supposed to exclude us in anything. You see that they have made more inputs than men. The campaign and demand for women inclusion in the scheme of things will naturally stop the moment they realize that it is in their hands to change the narrative and be counted as partners in progress. You know my phone is central. And now we have Chingwe Ugele who joins us to discuss more on the relevance of International Women's Day. Thank you so much for joining us, Chingwe. Thank you. Blessings. And I want to say happy International Women's Day to you before anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important we put that out. Of course, I wish you the same. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I kind of like, kinda like feel odd. Maybe I should just take That's a That's the walk, idea. You know? I, it's intentional. I could go on if you want me <laughs> to. But fine, fine, <laughs> All fine. right, uh, Chiwi, we're talking about celebrating the women, right? This is another day that we try to create awareness on the relevance of gender equality, gender inclusion. And um, I think we've come a long way when it comes to clamoring for inclusion. But uh, I think that it's good to see from a different perspective this time around, where it's not just women asking to be involved. It's women seeing themselves as capable. Because let's, let's be honest, um, the mindset has dug so deep in the minds of so many women that they are now, um, in your report, uh, one of the women said, uh, that's the wife of uh, Alex Oti said, we cannot afford to be complacent, right? A lot of women have gone to that level where they are now satisfied being back benches. So what is the relevance, let's start off with that, of the International Women's Day, especially for the mindset shift of a typical African woman? I think what it stands to achieve is to let women know that they can always take the front seat and not wait to be called upon. You know, you don't, um, you are not a less gender, uh, you are not a lesser gender, if I should put it that way. So um, the International Women's Day celebration is just like an awakening for all women out there that they have all it takes to occupy the front seat. They do not always have to be the backbenchers. They do not always have to demand and ask that um, they be given a space in the scheme of things. They should actually um, make the bold step themselves and then call others to join them because um, we've come to the point where it's no longer normal to say um, we are being marginalized, the men are taking uh, space everywhere. Whereas we know that some, of, some women are actually better than the men. So um, what the International Women's Day celebration uh, seeks or sets out to achieve is to create that awareness that the woman herself will have to be the one to, channel, um, to, to move or um, uh, lead the campaign that yes, you need to take us seriously and we need to be where we should be. All right. Um, well, let's look at um, how the women are indeed ferried. For me, I'd like to look at um, as they celebrate Happy um, International Women's Day um, in Nigeria, especially where you are. 
Uh, you've been covering the reports, uh, telling us what's going on in the, in the eastern part of Nigeria, uh, what's emanating from there, from the, from the good news in Aba and the tough times especially. Uh, how are women faring, especially with these tough times that we find ourselves, the economic hardship? Um, you're a lady as well. I'm sure the money you used to cook that beautiful, sweet pot of uh, soup uh, is no longer the same. So how are they coping now that they're going into celebrating uh, with International Women's Day and the economic hardship? It's not the best of time for the women all over the country. Um, the Southeast is not exempted in any way. Um, it's just that um, a lot of people still do what they need to do in order to you know, stay, um, keep their businesses afloat, maintain their families and take care of their personal needs. Because um, the average woman down here feels that she needs to do extra because it's not like you pointed out, the amount of money people spend these days on not just cooking soup, on virtually everything. It's really um, tough out there. And the women are still holding up. They are not, you know, they are not letting down. They are not letting anything go by. They make sure, some have even um, gone into extra businesses. People who are in, in uh, are working in public services or um, you know, those who are civil servants, some have got extra um, gigs where they get money from in order to help cushion the effect of what is happening because they can't just depend on what the government have to offer. But then that is also to say that um, a lot of women here are also, you know, looking up to the government to come to their aid, especially those of them that are in the civil service. People who do not have um, the, the, the will or the desire to go into any extra work, but they want to be able to provide for their family or support provision in their family. So they expect some kind of um, um, uh, empowerment or uh, palliative, you know, like stimulus packages from the government to help them um, carry on with their responsibilities in the home. Women of the Southeast are quite resilient. They are people who don't give up easily. They can do just about anything. They can trade anything, you know, to make ends meet. So that's how people have been coping down here. Otherwise, it's really a tough time. Also, Chinwe, um, I think that um, looking at the statement that we've always, uh, we've, we've come to know, uh, women are nation builders. Beyond the sentiment, let's look at the statistics now. Um, we've seen several times that when women lead, there is, you know, it, it, tends, it tends, tends to be a little put together. I'm not saying more than men. There have been, um, you know, certain examples where some women, you know, mismanage and all that. And then some people tend to capitalize on that. But if we're looking from a bigger perspective at the bigger picture, we've seen the statistics. The statistics are there. Um, some countries in the past, Liberia, um, Senegal, and countries like that that have been led by women, we've seen how well they fed. So if we're looking at the theme, investing in women and accelerating progress, don't you think it's time we start having that conversation? I, I, I think my question is, why is still there a delay in um, a 50-50% gender equality? I wouldn't say that you know, African countries are not doing good enough when it comes to inclusion, but why do we still have that delay in making women an active part of you know, decision-making in countries? That is because the women themselves have not come to terms with the fact that it is about time that they take over. Um, secondly is because they also feel that the kind of persons they would want to occupy positions of authority have not stepped up. Because um, like I always ask, I said, now that we are saying and we are preaching and campaigning women support women, women supporting women, does it mean that anytime I see a woman who I know is not fit to occupy position of leadership that I should just, you know, throw my weight behind such a woman. Okay, now, the truth is that women, the right persons, need to begin to take, you know, steps. Because if we stay back and women can collectively come together and push the narrative, bring out those people who we feel and who we know we have seen their antecedents and we know we can attest to what they can offer we can push them 
and say, we are supporting you. Go out there and campaign. Go out there and see how we can use the numerical strength we have to push the narrative. And listen, if women cannot do this, because what usually happens is that we still approach elections with sentiments. Now, I'm looking at the political landscape. Because if a woman I know is very capable, is fit to occupy a position of authority, is campaigning or running for an election, and I have one person from my village or my friend running, and I know the woman is more fit to occupy that position, I'm probably going to support my friend. You understand? And that has been the reason why we are where we are today. So I suggest that what women should do at this point, since it's been difficult for the men to actually give us that um, level playing field, because when they even talk about level, level playing field and tell you that in political parties, they allow women to take, um, uh, what's that called again, interest form, you know, expression of interest forms. They take them free of charge. It's not really free. It's free in, in, in practice, in principle, some, to some extent, but it's not free because they come with lots of demands. And then you begin to ask yourself, how are you going to do this? So that is why I feel that women should come together in all the political parties they belong. If there are very good, you know, articulate women in those parties, they should push the narrative and present them as the one they want. You'll be surprised that you have some men queuing up also behind such women because whether we have credible women in Nigeria, there are lots of them. But the problem we have as women is that we still look at it that, oh, she's not going to win. Then who told you she can't win? She can't win if she has all it takes to occupy that position. So let us go back and see how we do these things. If there are women who are interested in running, but they are so scared. They are so scared to step, step up. Because recently, I had a, a friend tell me that when she bought the interest, especially of interest form in 2019 to run for election, you know, she was cowed into dropping and, you know, dropping her ambition just because of the demands that we are making of her. And it's not really easy. Look at the economic background of the woman who is coming out. Is she coming out because she has all the money? But she feels that she has something to offer to the society. And then you go out there and you make such demands. It's really naturally going to deter her and discourage a lot of people from coming out. Because if she shares her experience, someone who already had an interest will just naturally withdraw. So that is the situation where we find ourselves. But I think the earlier we take better steps, because recently the uh, pr program, um, the Awolo War, was, um, there was a program I watched on TV yes. where some presidents from Africa actually came to honor um, Adeshino, you know, yes. because yes. of the yes. award yes. that was given to him by uh, yes. the, the Awolo War Foundation. Yes. Now, that also, you know, brought some things to my mind, and I said, look, the presidents we have coming from Africa, and I saw a good number of women, women presidents from the African continent, why can't it happen in Nigeria? What is stopping us? What is holding us back? And we have such women. We even have better women to do all of this. All right. Uh, we, we do get your stance. And, of course, we, we, we hope to see um, the progress that these uh, conversations will indeed bring. Most importantly, don't forget we also have Samia Suluwa San of Tanzania, who's doing amazingly well. So far, so good. They've uh, seen a, a very good increase and turn up of the economy. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure. I've been mean, listening to your own point of view concerning Women's Day. Very fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Still Breakfast Central. We'll go for a quick break. Next up would be the CBN crisis. Most importantly, Nigeria's economic situation. And of course, how are you coping as a Nigerian? Stay with us. Well, let's take a look at the current situation of Nigeria's economy. Well, just yesterday, a forensic document examiner, an expert on handwriting analysis, seconded to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, uh, named Bami Haruna, said the analysis conducted on the documents used to release a huge sum of $6.2 million from the Central Bank of Nigeria in February 2023 showed that they were forged. Hmm. Now, this leaves questions hanging in the air. Who forged the former president, Mamadou Buhari's signature, and of course, that of the um, SGF, a boss Mustafa's signature as well. Is there more to go to the Mifile's time as CBN governor? 
Well, I mean, someone did say that uh, Godwin Mifeli is a gift that keeps on giving, even after he has stepped down, because we still keep seeing things. Well, anyways, in a similar development, the Minister of Finance, Wale Adun, while appearing before the Senate Committee on Finance, chaired by Senator Sani Musa, said that the free printing of Naira notes for eight years under former President Muhammad Buhari has led to the current economic downturn faced by citizens. Well, joining us now to look at the state of the nation at Nigeria's dwindling economy is Shegu Shokwito, uh, economist and, of course, public affairs analyst. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Good Thanks morning. for having me. Good morning. <laughs> all right. So, I, I mean, looking at all the situation, first off, uh, what do you make of uh, that statement uh, yesterday? A forensic expert saying that it seems there was forgery um, and monies um, going to about $6.3 million dollars were taken from the CBN. We're starting to see a back and forth. What's your take on that, first off? <laughs> um, at the moment, I think we should just um, wait and watch this play out. Um, and I say that because a lot of the things that we're hearing flies in the face of reason. They just don't make sense. Um, so, you know, but at the same time, you these claims are being made by a special investigator that was appointed by the president um, on that oath in the court of law um, with forensic ex experts trying to corroborate, you know. So that, that, that's pretty damning evidence. Um, but I also know that um, when it comes to high stakes politics, anything is possible, you know. So I'm not necessarily getting all carried away with what we're hearing. I'm, I'm just maintaining a sit down look <laughs> so you don't look Poster, approach. Yeah. yeah, because um, I, I think that the truth will eventually come out. Um, for me, what I see playing out is some sort of an agenda that is tied around a vendetta against MFLA. MFLA didn't cover himself with glory, you know, with the way he ran the CBN. But, I mean, these things that are being said, look, my father worked in the CBN up to deputy director level. Mm. The Central Bank of Nigeria is not... It's, it's a very strong institution. It's very difficult to interfere with the, to the levels that people are um, suggesting. And it's, it's almost impossible to take 6.2 billion, billion, billion dollars out of the CBN's account in cash. Um, <laughs> in fact, it's, it's near impossible to take it out of the CBN's account um, by transfers without proper authorization. It's, it's almost impossible. You can blame the CBN people for not resisting orders from above, but for the CBN governor to forge the president's signature. Uh, it's, I, I, I don't believe it. I'm sorry. So are we, are we <laughs> saying that for all, really of these, for all of these things to be coming out, are we saying that there are no systems in place? Because exactly. if, if there are systems, then somebody should be accountable for it. Because it looks like they're you, you mentioned the vendetta. Yeah. They're trying to pin this on one particular Absolutely. person. Absolutely. I mean, look, the CBN, this is the organization that supervises the entire banking industry. They have a banking supervision department. They have a bank examination department. They are loaded with forensic analysts. Um, how can the regulator of an entire financial sector have sitting at the top of it a signature forger? You know, we, we have to examine the simple logic behind this thing, and it flies in the face of reason. I'm sorry. I struggle to believe these things. If they turn out to be true, then I will, my, my jaws will hang down <laughs> and refuse to close. You know, so, so for me, I think we should just still wait. Um, um, $6.2 billion is not small money. So it's, 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 this is not something no. that can be swept under the carpet. So Six. I think the truth will eventually come out. $6.2 billion. Yeah. Um, but one question everyone seems to be asking is, in all of this rancor, the former president has not been called. Absolutely. Is it that there's Absolutely. an immunity clause that still <laughs> affects the former president? Former presidents in Nigeria tend to be immune. Um, even though the constitution doesn't confer that immunity on them, just mm. by virtue of the kind of politics that we play. Yeah. Um, you know, and we saw the same thing play out for Jonathan. Um, in fact, it's almost a mirror image of what happened under Buhari, where the president had an agenda against Dasuki. 
and arrested him, put him in prison almost for the entirety of his tenure, um, made terrible allegations regarding $2.1 billion against him. Um, all of the witnesses that were called in court kept saying they, they got instructions, they had documents, but President Jonathan was never once subpoenaed to come and you know, testify you know, in court. And I, and I think that's just the way our society runs. You, our, our, our former presidents are immune. And, and, and it's a problem because if we say that these things happen, <clears throat> excuse me, if we say that these things happened under the president, former president Buhari, then we must call him to give his own account. You know, if he never signed that document, he's alive, he's in Daura, just call him, you know, five, ten minutes stand in the witness box and he's gone. Accord him all the respect and, you know, fly him in with a chopper, give him full security detail, but let him talk, yeah. you know, so that he can tell us categorically, I signed it or I did not. You know, but we will never do that because, you know, this is just how we play our politics. Do we see this towing the line of the better I do story? Because it started off as blaming <laughs> one person, then eventually we're hearing that, oh, she, the permission was actually taken from appropriate authorities, but we never heard from the appropriate authorities. And then at the end of the day, somebody had to take the fall. So is this becoming a pattern? Like, we blame it on one person, we try and try and try, no matter what they say, we disregard it, and then it comes back to you being at fault. It's, it's, it's not just becoming a pattern. It is our way. This is how we do things. You know, I mean, you can go on and on, just different cases that come out, you know, you hear it, your jaws drop, and you think, oh, wow, this is incredible. Surely heads must roll. Mm. But heads never roll. This heads nasty. never roll in this country. So even the better I do, where is she now? You know, mm. what's going on with that investigation? Um, Olubumi uh, Tunji Ojo, He's who back is to work. my personal favorite minister, in this administration because of the work he's, he appears to be doing. He was fingered, you know, and he just said a couple of very funny stuff and he's working. Yeah. You know, he's walking free and walking and he's still a star boy. Uh, this is the, <laughs> it's the kind of country that we're on. It's very unfortunate. And you can go all the way back, every single administration right down to Abbasanjo, you know, I mean, where, where's the Desiani case now? Mm. A highly celebrated international, you know, you can write a, a, um, a, an, an international espionage story around this one incident. But here we are, nothing. You know, so it's just a story. I don't think anything will happen with this MFLA thing. I think it's going to go away. Yeah. I don't think MFLA is going to go to jail. I, I don't believe he's guilty of these things. But even if he were, I don't think he will go to jail. You know, another problem we have in this country is I, we also read, and I'm sure you guys must have read, where Better I Do was alleged to have said that she would talk. Yeah, that if, yeah, they, sure. if they try it, that she will talk. talk. You know, and, and we know what that means. You know, so, so the thing goes all the way up and goes all the way down. Yeah. Everybody is complicit. So it's like somebody would say Nigeria is one huge crime scene. Mm -hmm. It's just a crime scene and everybody is guilty. You know, so that's why you will never see consequences. It's why you will never see heads roll. Um, and it's why these things are going to continue. Until we get a leader who puts his foot down, leads with integrity, says no more, and shows that it's in, indeed no more. Uh, we're we're going to keep getting all this high-stake drama. All right. Let's take a look at the um, Minister of Finance. Um, he did speak up as well yesterday when he invited um, to the Senate to need to explain how the economy can be taken away from its doldrums. Mm -hmm. But let's take a look. Let's watch what he said. From the strategic reserves of grain, of food, and another 62,000 tons of 60,000 tons of rice made available just to tide us over that period because you have a good rice season harvest, you have a good wet season harvest, and that issue because the inflation is still inflation. <coughs> and I don't want to take our time going into the fact that it is going across the border and so forth. But what I would say is this by emphasizing <coughs> putting food, putting money in people's hands, giving people purchasing power, that may be. Raises prices a bit, but it stops it going across the border. At a little higher price, the farmers will sell locally. And in terms of putting purchasing power in people's hands at this critical time, apart from the direct payments, there's the nano uh, uh, industries, the artisans, the water sellers, the food sellers, and, and repairers, and so forth. They are all, there's 50 billion naira going to be given across 
that whole ecosystem, same to same, same way, same for local governments. At least 1,000 people will benefit from 50,000 naira. Gives them cash in their hand to go and do what they feel is their priority. If it's food, they'll go to the market and buy food. Similarly, small and medium scale, and I'm trying to speak Senator, to what you said about what about the economy as a whole. The economy is not a large scale. The heart of the economy is small and medium scale, especially in an entrepreneurial country like Nigeria, where everybody wants to be quote unquote on his own. So that's the, um, the Minister of Finance um, making sure that he's breaking everything down. Um, a lot of people have said he seems very learned. He does understand um, the, the steps to take in order to balance the economy. But then again, it's starting to look like, uh, for some people, they say it's a bit of a trial and error. If this process doesn't work, let's try this process. Mm -hmm. What's your take on the fact that, in the course of that conversation, he did mention that too much money was printed into the system, about 23 trillion or something was printed into the system for the past eight years. Mm. And while he said that, a, an article of March 2020 did emerge where the current president, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, had said to mm. Buhari, print more money in the system and remove that so that people can cope uh, during the uh, pandemic. How do we juxtapose these two statements? <laughs> looking at the fact that a blame trail is about to go straight to the former president again. As usual. As usual. Yeah. You know, and this is, this is the politics that we play. And, and somebody needs to remind the president that he's a member of the APC. And the former president was a member of the APC. And in fact, he had full access to Asurok for the eight years. Somebody needs to remind him because it, it almost sounds as if um, we're watching some sort of surreal drama and... and um, uh, the president lives in an alternate reality where actually he's a member of the PDP. It's just that we are all thinking he's in APC. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. You, you can't be blaming yourself. He's blaming himself. Look, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu was the national leader. That was his title. He was the national leader of the APC. You know, for all of these eight years that we're talking about, how can they? He's blaming himself. You know, so I think it would sound better if he comes out to say, look, we made mistakes. We did these things. We did these things wrong and we're trying to correct them now. I think that would sound better, it would sound more honorable, you mm. know, from the president. Um, now, to the substance of what um, the Minister of Finance was saying, yeah, he does have a point in terms of the ways and means. Um, it's, it's a terrible way to finance. In fact, it's not just terrible, it's illegal. You know, so that's another thing that, yeah, President Buhari should actually be called and tried. He broke the law. He should have been impeached. He broke the law with uh, brazen impunity. They did it over and over again. But guess what? He wasn't the only one. It happened under Jonathan, and I suspect it's probably happening now. Yeah. We will see that the CBN governor has said no more, which means he probably has already printed some before he now said, we're not giving you any more. Yeah. You know, meanwhile, it should be impossible to get ways and means today because you are running at way above the threshold set by the CBN Act and uh, the Financial Responsibility Act. So um, uh, for what I do to say this now is it's blame gaming. What we want are solutions. Yes, we know that they printed 22, 23 trillion. Money supply now is trending between 78 to 90 trillion, depending on who you listen to. That's way too much. The CBN is trying to, you know, rein that Perfect. in, yeah. you know, mop up the liquidity with the NPR and all of that. Um, something I don't agree with, by the way. I think that was too rash, mm. um, but they're trying. There's something you said, Joe, and I agree with you 100%. It's clear for anybody that understands the world of economics and the world of finance, this is pure trial and error. That what's going on now is we've jumped, we've jumped into the water, forgetting we can't swim, and we're flaming for their life. That's what's going on now. And let nobody make any mistakes about this. I suspect we will eventually find our way out of it, you know, because that's just how life works. The truth always wins, light always prevails. So I think we'll find a way out eventually. But a lot of suffering would have happened. A lot of people may have died. People would have lost their jobs. Lives would have been changed irreparably before we find a way out. There are measures that this government needs to be taking now that I still am not seeing. A lot of the things that are being done are tokenistic. They, they, they just, I mean, talking about grain reserves, 100,000 metric tons. Rice alone, our consumption per annum is 7 
million metric tons per annum in this country. So you are releasing 100,000 metric tons of grains. That includes rice, wheat, millet, millet. you know, and all of those things. It's, it's just, it's, it's not even a scratch of the surface. Not, it's like a pin in, a, in an ocean. It simply will do nothing. We have to go beyond these things and become brave. The, uh, the president was very audacious and bold in declaring subsidy was gone. He needs very serious, audacious steps now to stop this problem because he created this. So one of the things that he needs to understand and his handlers must understand is that subsidies are an inevitable part of driving the development of this country. You can't do away with it. And we can see the outcome now. So am I saying we should go back to fuel subsidies? No. I think that that's, the horse has bolted. It's out of the, the stable. We can't rein it back in. But we must return subsidy in some form. And I've suggested two things. One, transportation subsidies. Direct, look, sit down, spend a three to five, six month period working with NURTW and all other organized transportation systems, you know, associations, and find a way to put money in their hands to so subsidize that's, that's, the so cost of one. transportation. One is transportation. transportation. You know what? Let, just hold your thought. Let's go for yeah. a quick break. When we come back, we'll take a listen to the second. Uh, form of subsidy that would definitely help us out of this current situation. We, we, we've got bills to pay. We'll be right back. All right, so we're right back. Um, our guest is still here. So um, right before the break, you were talking about the kind of um, um, uh, subsidies that we need now. Yeah. Uh, can you help us run through this? So, so you need transportation subsidies. Um, that, has to, that can kick in immediately. It's something that can be implemented within a couple of months, um, such that you put money in some manner in the hands of transport, um, transport service owners um, through NURTW, the Uber system, you know, whatever, um, including the truck drivers that bring food. You know, these guys are organized. So you can actually put subsidies in their hands and crash the cost of transportation. The cost of living problem will subside significantly because transportation represents about 30 to 40 percent of the average spend of the average Nigerian, yeah. right? So that's one. Um, the second thing that I think can be done, that would also, by the way, have an impact on food prices because transportation costs, guess what, represent 70 to 80% yeah. of the actual landing cost of food in the market yeah. from the farm gates. So if you face transportation, find a way to subsidize that. It will cost us trillions. So this subsidy, we're running away. We can't. If we don't restore them, we, are, we have an existential crisis on our hands. Then find a way to subsidize food. It's difficult. This one is tough. I've not thought it through properly. But I think that what happens abroad can also happen here, food stamps of some sort, where the most vulnerable identify them and give them food stamps. I mean, who's the most vulnerable? Even the three of us sitting uh, here. I'm vulnerable, we're, we're, probably, we're probably vulnerable. <laughs> I'm vulnerable. <laughs> this is what's going on, you know? But at least let's identify the ones that truly cannot eat, because there are people like that now, mm -hmm. and find a way to subsidize food for them. Then the third thing um, that has to happen urgently and immediately is for the CBN to revalue the Naira. The CBN, by their own hands, look, forget this, all of this funny stuff about Binance. The CBN devalued the Naira deliberately. On the 29th of January, the value of the Naira in the official market moved from 890 Naira or thereabouts to 1,500 overnight. It, this was a decision of the CBN. We have to retract that. We have to go back. The CBN needs to fund the market, provide supply intervene even at the risk of depleting our reserves to a certain extent, intervene in the market for two months until the foreign direct investment, the foreign portfolio investment, the diaspora remittances can be reined in and pushed into the market as supply, which will then force the price down. But until that time, we need intervention. If the, if the government does not intervene, I'm sorry, we are heading for a crisis. Okay, two things. Um, first, talking about subsidizing food. I think uh, recently we heard using um, the, what the governor of Lagos yes. is trying to do, uh, mm -hmm. the Mama Put uh, system to reach out to people. Mm. I think the challenge with that would be, again, we lack accountability in this country. Yeah. So whether or not it gets to the adequate, let's even say that we are not vulnerable, there are people who are more <laughs> vulnerable. How do we, uh, what is the metric? How do we check that these people actually get because to be honest all the palliatives all the noise about giving people things we hardly see anybody come out and say oh i was a beneficiary then secondly in terms of um the um the, the narrow devaluation. Mm -hmm. Let's even look beyond the selective amnesia that this current administration mm -hmm. is choosing to have. And, uh, you know, the whole blame game about the fact that for eight years has been, mm -hmm. there's been a free float and now there's a free fall. 
Now, the CBN has said that it is no longer in their hands, that, uh, you know, controlling the currency now depends on the uh, level of supply and demand, mm -hmm. you know, in the foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. What is the veracity of that statement? It's is not it true? true? It's not true. The CBN has full control. They, are the, they have the legal backing to manage the, the value of the Nigerian currency. It's, it's, a, it's a law. So whatever they decide to do today will stand. But let me quickly backtrack to the Mama Put idea. I think that's a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's terrible. The intentions are good, but it's almost impossible to implement properly. But there's something else that Lagos State government has tried to do. They've tried to subsidize food in the markets, working with the market women associations, putting money in their hands and giving a 25% discount to the people. The market women are kind of abusing that, but that's a system that could work. So that's something that I think we need to look more into and probably ramp up. Maybe instead of a 25% discount, maybe we can do a 50% discount that government is funding. They're using the uh, MTN money, uh, mobile money wallet mm -hmm. to, 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 to drive this. So there, there, are, there are platforms on ground that we can use to drive some sort of food subsidy program that can even reach all citizens. Look, it can reach all citizens. It will cost the government money, but this is our reality. The subsidies we're running away from, we cannot run away from them. Now, to go back to the CBN issue, the CBN can, and, it, and they did it. Last, two weeks ago, they provided $16 million to about 800 BDCs at 1,300 Naira to the dollar. Meanwhile, the official rate at that time, on that day, was 1,006. So the CBN actually had two official rates on that day. Wow. What we blame the MFLA for, the CBN has done. Mm -hmm. They can do whatever they want to do to save the day. I don't like the idea of having two official rates. I think what they should have done was to, inter to have intervened with that $16 million at the prevailing rate. Now, if you provide enough liquidity for long enough, the rates will come down. It's, so they're right that it's a market um, demand and supply thing, but the supply part is in their control to a certain degree within the limits of our foreign reserves. You know, so there's a limit to how much they can do, but they can do something. This hands-off approach that they are you know, running now, it won't work. We're going to end up with people on the streets attacking you and I because they are seeing you with your lovely hair and everything and your beautiful <laughs> suit, and they're thinking you have money yeah. and that you are the problem, that you are part of food eating. So we will get to that point, I pray not, where they have not, are going to start attacking people that they assume have. Look, they went to raid warehouses. Yes. Now I hear in Lagos, in Egbeda, Akonwonjo, and those types of places, they are raiding people's food stores, um, um, people that sell food in the market. They just break into the shops and, and steal food. It's getting there, you know, so we've got to be careful with this. Wow. Well, it's getting there. I want to say thank you so much, Inspector Peter, for joining us. Um, thank you. I mean, I think, I think we're going to have a, a, a free masterclass on Breakfast Central <laughs> and what the, <laughs> what the economists think. Yeah. Yes, and, and I mean, we'll look at next week where we can have you and, of course, uh, one more person, you know, take the rein and, of course, break it down systematically, possibly using the screens to lovely. explain how best... Um, the current uh, Minister of Finance, and of course, in short, the entire economy uh, can be better for it. Thank you That'd so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. All right. Before we let you go, let me also mention quickly that some suspected bandits on Thursday reportedly stormed the uh, Lea Primary School, uh, Kuriga, in the volatile Chikung local government area of Kaduna State. Abducted scores of pupils. Uh, the figures are not yet uh, certain. Uh, some say 300, 280, 200. Or well, the incident which took place around 8 a.m. shortly after the morning assembly has left many terrified very very sad and that uh, this is one story that everyone is talking about um we will be talking about it later on uh later on we'll talk about it uh, possibly in the course of um uh the front pages but all right Let's go straight to the front pages. That's what we're going to next. Yes, it is. And uh, we're going to be starting off with the Punch newspaper. Now, um, we did start with a story where we were saying that bandits kidnapped 280 pupils from Kaduna State, which is a very sad story. Um, uh, we saw visuals of, of that, uh, some pictures where, you know, the sandals were, you know, put together and all that. And the parents were looking worried. And it's making people ask, what is going on in the country? We're having um, food crisis. And of course, there's also insecurity. Security. And uh, we see under it, uh, teachers say gunmen invaded the school after morning assembly and kidnapped these pupils as well as workers. And uh, the governor has visit visited the schools and promises pupils rescue. The JNI, PTA, Amnesty International have also condemned the attack.
And uh, at the top of the paper, of course, uh, Wigwe's philanthropy, dedication to gospel exemplary. Uh, they're still talking about uh, Herbert Wigwe's um, uh, funeral service that was held for about three days. Um, and on page 21, Tinubu suspends REA boss and directors over alleged 1.2 billion Naira fraud. And still on page 21, reps demand 2024 budget review over forex crisis and uh, we look at page 25 kaduna plane crash pilots escape death air chief orders a probe into the crash and on page seven you find the minimum wage discussion where workers differ and governments one revenue sharing reviewed and finally on page 14 we see a uh, recover five trillion naira on remitted mda taxes according to the reps telling the firs that's it on the Punch newspaper. Well, taking a look at the Punch, I think um, one of the biggest stories that did come off yesterday was the suspension of the REA boss and the directors over 1.2 billion naira fraud. I think it still coincides with what we've just said this morning, especially with our guest um, who joined earlier. That it's not just about um, suspensions, it's not just about probe, it's about someone who has to um, face the penalty. And take of carrying out um, yeah. such actions. Stealing seems to become a lingua franca uh, within the four walls of, of each parastatal administration, if you put it that way. And what we've started to see is that fingers are, are being pointed at individuals. Oh, it's not me, it's this person, yeah. and so on. Because at the end of the day, I mean, we've said it few, just a few minutes ago, nothing will change. happen. Yeah. Nothing will change. Nothing. Everything will still go on as usual, business as usual. Yes, this amount was stolen. I do recall the um, the past eight to twelve years, if I recall. Um, in short, let's just go back to sixteen years ago. What was being stolen? We kept hearing them in thousands, yeah, thousands, and then it, it elevated to it moved on to millions, millions. Mm -hmm. millions. And people were saying the way we are going, we'll start hearing trillions, billions, old. And somebody else said, no, we will get to trillions. Mm -hmm. And here we are. we are. So when there's no cause for, for action. And there are no penalties. There, there are no repercussions. Yes. No penalties. The next person will say, after all, I always use this analogy whenever I, whenever I talk about this, especially now that we're looking at it. It's like a house where the mother cooks stew and meat. You know, the first child goes, takes the meat from the stew. The mother says nothing. Taking, and licks the mother said, why did you take the meat? Don't do it again, no. <laughs> what happens? The remaining five children have seen the result of having stolen the meat from the pot and nothing really happened. Yeah. It simply means that, oh boy, it's quite ahead can. Of. After all, you just get away with a, with a warning. And imagine the five of them doing the same thing and the mother still tells them, don't do it again, no. I'm warning you. So it, it's what we're starting to see. Um, it, it's called one word. It's called impunity. Yeah. Where people just take it with reckless abandon. They feel there's nothing wrong. Yeah. After all, Mr. B did it, and that's exactly and what And it, it's see. sad because they know that Nigerians are clamor. If, if there's one thing that Nigerians have been asking for for the longest time is accountability. So they understand that when something happens, somebody must be pointed at. Somebody has to take the fall. So they've realized that that blame game works. But what else do they realize? The fact that when you blame and blame and blame, people get tired of that story mm -hmm. and want to move on to something else. Mm -hmm. Because of course, there's no attention span to be given to people stealing money. When people are suffering, the economy is, is going on a downward trend. Yeah. So they try the blame game for a while. And then when it goes round and round and round and they see that that story is dropping, that's all we hear about it. And it's just so sad. Very sad. Well, you can react to the stories as well. Call in and let us know what you think about the latest kidnap or any other stories you find on the front page that interest you. Uh, the phone numbers we put there on the screen so you can start dialing and feel free to feed in. Let's hear what your thoughts are concerning uh, these stories that we're looking at from the punch. Um, and it's also sad, a kidnap again in Chukun local government area. By the way, Chukun is well known to have faced a lot of kidnappings in the past yeah. years. Yeah. Last year, uh, a huge number of persons were kidnapped and some were killed. Uh, there was a story of a mother who, who was kidnapped alongside her, uh, four of her children. Uh, one of them did not come back because he was killed alongside others. Uh, after last year, about a few years ago, there was also a kidnap along um, that same Chikun local government area where scores of persons were indeed kidnapped and some never came back home, while some did uh, as a result of being released. Well, 
these cases are one of uh, such that we will get to see uh, especially on our headers uh, for a long time from today and I'm sure it will get into the weekend. But let's go straight to our next paper uh, while you can also participate. Our next paper simply is Nigerian Tribune. Mm. On the front page of the Nigerian Tribune there, we can see the headline looking very, very um, similar to the one we just saw from the punch. Bandits invade Kaduna school, 280 pupils missing, feared abducted. Ensure safe return of abducted pupils, reps tell security agencies. And in this, in this part, Nigerians are asking how, you know, with a question mark. But then again, let's hope that, uh, we really hope that we can get the number of uh, students, uh, in short, all of them, uh, back uh, to the loving hands of their families. Alleged 1.2 billion naira misappropriation, Tinubu suspends Ria MD, appoints Adil Abu's running mate, non-executive director. On page 3, you find that story. Armed robbers attack two banks in Kogi. The video was and has been circulating on social media. Um, Kogi State, where armed men took it upon themselves to ensure that they can make money and uh, survive the tough economy by attacking banks. It's not the way to go. We always uh, tell you that. It's not an excuse. Uh, everyone is facing the heat, so yours cannot be different, especially when you want to react to the current situation. Increasing rate of poverty, hunger in Nigeria, worrisome, JNI Khan says. Ondo Guba, no decision yet on zoning PDP. That's another story there. Labor defers an appropriate new minimum wage for workers. Southwest NLC proposes 794,000. TUC says 497,000. OPS appeals for understanding. Southeast NLC TUC proposed 540,000. So there's, there's different figures. We have <laughs> the different zones are calling for a different minimum wage package. This makes it even more confusing. But we hope, they do, they do recall that they have a deadline before April 1st. Um, the federal government and, of course, um, the Labour Party, uh, um, Nigerian Labour uh, Congress, I beg your pardon, and the TUC need to have an agreement. Leadership and alliance with a time by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Uh, that's, uh, um, you can read more about it. And you can see on the picture there, Dr. Addition and his wife, Grace, uh, receiving the picture, the award. He got the award, uh, the Chief Aolo. Um, I'm talking about um, that wonderful award that saw uh, many other persons fly into the country to celebrate with him. I can say Addition is a, is a wonderful person, no doubt. Uh, we can see it in his strides. And that's all we're taking on the Nigerian Tribune. On the front page, we can move on to the next paper. All right, uh, the next paper is the Vanguard um, newspaper. And uh, at the top of it, or the major story you see there is the minimum wage, the NLC TUC split, and they want different pay in zones. There's been drama between the NLC and the TUC, oh. I think, uh, for like since last year, <laughs> late last year, where the TUC um, disembarked their journey and stopped, you know fighting together with the NLC because they've said that the NLC is not fighting for the people, they're fighting for themselves. We've seen several times where <laughs> strikes are called and strikes are cancelled because of some meetings that we never hear about, we never know what the outcomes of the meetings are. They just call for strike and then call it off without the TUC knowing. And now the NLC and the TUC want different pay in zones because obviously they're not in agreement. And then uh, at the top of the newspaper, you see CBN to sanction DFIs, PMBs, MFBs over late submission of returns. And uh, just below it, on page 7, we see Edo gubernatorial. Uh, women and youths want the suspension of Shaibo's impeachment process. Now, uh, Philip Shaibo is the embattled uh, deputy governor of Edo State, and uh, the petition came as a result of, um, well, according to them, the petition came as a result of, um, you know, perjury and divulging Edo State government secrets. And uh, now the women <laughs> and youth are saying that, well, they want peace, but they just want the right thing to be done. For them to be clamoring for a suspension, it means that probably they still want him in power. But the impeachment process has kick-started. 
And uh, of course, we're going to be seeing how that unfolds. And uh, we're still seeing uh, Wigwe's funeral service. Uh, the daughter says, you left me with enormous shoes to feel. Very uh, sad story. I, I was watching some of the uh, tributes that were paid to him, and uh, he really was a great he was, man. He and was a wonderful Yes, person. he was. And one thing that really stood out for me was the fact that people actually you know, came out to say that uh, the Wigwe University, which he left uncompleted, that was supposed to kickstart in September, and um, unfortunately left that uncompleted completed and people were worried you know but now people are coming out to say that they will do all they can to make sure that it meets the standard that Herbert wanted it to meet and in fact uh, in Dangote's statement he said that he was such a great man and for the refinery uh, a street on the refinery is going to be called Herbert Wigwe Street yeah. that he wanted to be that after they've all gone people come and they ask who is this Herbert Wigwe that that is how amazing he was you see um, dignitaries talking about him and it's quite sad because um, for the children especially and the family having to deal with three losses at a time is just really overwhelming and I can only imagine you know what they were going through but anyways um, going back to the government now uh, reps to review 2024 budget and demand assessment of the current exchange rate we just had that conversation <laughs> where the CBN again we see the blame game in play the CBN you know, is saying you know, that you know so in that story yeah um, when the budget was signed recall that the naira to the dollar was not what we have no so yes. in uh, uh, about three weeks ago the i think one of the one of the one of the statements made was that the current crisis that's affecting the naira and the dollar was going to affect the fiscal budget mm. and that's because when the fiscal budget was signed into of course law it was the the exchange rate that was used then is not what we have, have now. now. So take for instance, of course, uh, once it's signed into law, um, it, would, it would be assumed that this is how much will be needed to go to each sector. Mm -hmm. However, remember that maybe it was 800 Naira that was used to a dollar yeah. then. Because whatever we do in Nigeria, let's also remember that we dollar is part of our lives yes because we've you, you made it to. so yes we are a consuming nation we are not a producing nation it's not that we don't produce in as much as many people say we don't really produce but the truth is we don't pay attention to production we pay attention more to cons consuming because yeah. of the situation because of how the system is is being designed yes you know you have people who bring in things and they earn in dollars mm -hmm. as regards earning in naira, naira. so it pays mm -hmm. them more yes we have the so-called alleged statements of the uh, state governors who have received FAC, the FA, um, FAC um, allocations every month. Of course, then they convert it to dollar mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So what it simply means now is that the, the, the fiscal budget is not it's looking not, mm. it's not looking feasible anymore that this would work. It's about 20 something trillion now. Yeah. And, and now it's like, no, this won't work anymore because of the exchange rates. So it's understandable that they might have to revisit it and see. That means it's going to go higher. Well, so, Hopefully, they yeah. don't borrow from ways and means again, again to augment that. Again, because, I mean, if it were other governments, and this is not me talking down the Nigerian government, but mm. if it were other, uh, you know, administrations of other countries, you can actually believe or trust that process. But in a country where accountability is lost, you know, People will now see them revisiting that budget as another opportunity to, you to know, cut it down. No, yeah, not cut it to down, but it. overinflate. Uh -huh. That's the word because revisiting the budget is not a problem. But are we revisiting it because of the, you know, current the current situation, the or are we just revisiting it? And as a result of that, we're now seeing another Party. this one. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. normally it shouldn't be a problem. It should be understandable, but. Can we really understand the Nigerian government and their processes? Well, um, we'll leave that in their hands. <laughs> Let, let's see what, what, what will come out of it. But obviously, we knew that this, this was something that was going to happen, happen of eventually. Course. Of course. Because, I mean, like I said, some, some months back, particularly in February, mm. uh, it was likely, it was looking that way, that this would come up anytime soon. All right, uh, we still have uh, some stories on the Vanguard newspaper. Um, below, you see the same story, the Kaduna kidnap of uh, over 200 pupils and their teachers. And uh, just as Joa said, we're really hoping that um, they all come out of it. They can be rescued from that. Then um, on page eight, you see new satellite pay 
uh, TV will give Nigerians value for their money on page 30, which is sport. Um, <laughs> AJ versus Nganu, it's Judgment Day in mm. Riyadh. Mm. I, I, I don't know what those two have in hand, but I mean... Uh, I don't want to talk about it. Okay, <laughs> I actually give you space to express yourself because I don't it's... want to talk about it. I think I'll leave it for the I leave it for you to join the sports guys. I do have my points on that fight mm -hmm. though, but I think I leave it for the sports guys. They will better they will do a better job in dissecting that. Okay, well that said, I think that's all we can take on the Vanguard newspaper. Okay, we've looked at the Vanguard. Uh, one story you mentioned it says new satellite pay TV give Nigerians value for money. Just in case you have not heard. Um, there's a new satellite uh, coming into the market. In fact, it's not just a new satellite. It was actually um, introduced by a member of the cabinet. Yes, a member of the cabinet, the current uh, administration. Uh, it was said that this satellite, uh, and the secretary um, to the government, that's the SGF, um, Senator George Akume. Um, Senator George Akume was the one who flagged it off. Uh, and they did mention the name and say it's going to be, it's, it's going to answer the needs, cater to the needs of Nigerians who have been calling for multiple paid TV platforms. But then again, you could read up some more. Let's go to Daily Trust now as we wrap things up on the front pages. Daily Trust is another newspaper we're going to look at. It has on the front page there, bandits abduct 287 students, 287 students, principal as well, uh, all from Kaduna School. Um, over 20 orphans among victims, school not fenced, problem number one, but even at that, principal killed recently, wife abducted, very sad. They'll be rescued, Governor Sani says, were trailing attackers according to the police, that's what the police said, so they say the school was not fenced and um, their promise is that this could actually a lead to another rescue. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, they're able to get the uh, the students out of it. All right. The governor, um, Ubasani, has spoken, saying that they're working hard on that. Pilot survives as Air Force suffers mishap in Kaduna. Uh, they've also called for a probe and investigation into that crash. Borno dispatches team to rescue abducted female IDPs. That's another story again, where the IDP camp was attacked. Yeah. Uh, about 48 hours ago or so and <laughs> we did also see that in the news where you know some of the women who had escaped also spoke thoroughly of how they were able to escape two killed as robbers attack banks police station in kogi uh, quite similar to what we've seen in the other papers as well acf vax reps members uh, push for parliamentary system the parliamentary system conversation is still ongoing it's still on and we don't know why Many have said that it is a it is a dangerous call for a parliamentary system. Um, hopefully next week we'll bring in a, one of the rep members uh, to tell us why this parliamentary system is, is at the front burner again. A special edition of International Women's Day, that's what Daily Trust has. Tinubu suspends Ria ND, three others over alleged 1.2 billion naira misappropriation. Our question is who's going to prison, who's mm -hmm. going to be locked up? Who would be made uh, scapegoats to or rather, start a new process? Who is not process. going to prison? Because we're not going to see anything happen. <laughs> you know, it's, it just starts with a drop of water, like they say. A drop of water, feel you know, makes a mighty They've ocean. They've been dropping water since, but I think they're dropping in the basket. They, I, now <laughs> you're talking. I think it's going into the baskets. That's why we're not really seeing any, any, anything. Yeah. Nothing is coming out of that. But then again, uh, the president needs to talk tough and, of course, act tough. That's what many have said. And just like. Um, um, calls have been made that it's high time impunity is done away with. It is indeed the killer and the bane of the current um, economic situation that we find ourselves in. So that's all we're taking on the papers uh, from Daily Trust. Uh, we've brought to you other newspapers like The Punch, Tribune, Vanguard and the likes. I must sincerely apologize. Our phone lines um, today, um, if you've been struggling to get through, yes, of course, we're getting that feedback as well. But hopefully, uh, we'll get things sorted out uh, in a bit so you can also join in and make your contributions known to a cross-section of our viewers, be it in Nigeria, in Ghana, where we have people who join us as well, and other parts of the continent. All right, guys, so we'll go for a very quick break. When we come back, we'll take a look at um, another interesting story uh, that you would love to be part of, so stay with us.
All right, thanks for staying with us on Breakfast Central. Uh, very quickly, let's take a look at one video that has been making the rounds on social media. Now, a viral video emerged yesterday showing a prominent political and human rights activist, Omoye Lishore and Deji Adinyoju, warning officials of the EFCC whilst taking pictures of the building moments after they had been called to bar. Now, if you haven't seen the video, we'll take a look and we'll come back. he said you buy jobs if you take pictures of EFCC. You have to pay me. You have to pay me. You have to pay me. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that video sets the tone for our next discussion, which has seen several politicians called to bar just this week and what their role is in upholding the laws of the Constitution. And uh, joining us this morning is Omoye Lishore. Thank you so much for joining us. What the news says is, <laughs> since Deja has been called to bar, automatically you two <laughs> have been called to bar. Well, that, uh, I just, uh, it's important to correct that, that I went there to uh, rejoice with Deji. Uh, having been called to the happened. Nigerian bar. And uh, on our way there, the EFCC guys blocked the road. So we couldn't drive to the venue of the event, which was uh, the Body of Ventures complex, where the event was taking place. So we walked almost a kilometer to get there. So on our way back, we had to walk back to our car. And uh, here comes the EFCC guys accusing our camera person of taking photographs of uh, the building and told him that uh, he will buy a market uh, if he finds out that uh, he had taken a photograph of the building. And I was just wondering, what, is, what has come upon these guys? Anytime any uh, paramilitary group in Nigeria has access to weapons, they just feel like nobody, uh, nobody, nobody, was, nobody no Nigerian is worth anything. And the reason we reacted, I reacted the way we did, or we reacted the way we did, is we've lost a lot of cameras to these overzealous people. We've lost people, human beings have been, if we weren't there, they probably would have kidnapped him, taken him inside, forced him to delete uh, the, uh, yeah. the content, or, and then sometimes even detain people indefinitely for taking pictures, for doing things that are not in any way criminal. There, is, there was no sign on any building or along that road that you can't take photographs of uh, the ESCC building. The ESCC building, in my view, is a magnificent building that people should be going there to even visit. The most important building in the world, or as far as America is concerned, is the White House. Mm. People go there every morning to take pictures. People line up. In, in fact, you can go and visit the White House on certain days of the week. I mean, what is the problem with Nigeria is what I don't understand. But the... The thing was that our own symbolic reaction is let everybody who is carrying a weapon know that they are servants of the people and that they are not to lord themselves over anybody who is passing by or who is walking by or who is unfortunate to carry a camera. Because mm. there's no law that says that you cannot photograph or videotape uh, a public building. It's, that's why they call it public buildings. Uh, Maybe they might have restrictions within their own internal operations, but it shouldn't be about the public uh, building. And if anybody thinks, oh, this is because there's a security agent, what, is, what, what does it mean to be a security agent? Every day you see their footage on TV. You walk past. That place is actually the opposite of the Open University. Uh, uh, is it the Nigerian yes, yeah, National the Open University? university. Which is uh, also a public building. So that's a public road. Uh, but I know part of it is the overzealousness of these operatives. And a week before, I had the same issue with the DSS. They took over the Federal High Court. And they were the ones vetting lawyers. And that was why I even saw the president of uh, the Nigerian Bar Station there. And I told them, your organization is becoming useless. <laughs> if the DSS has to be the one vetting lawyers, people who spent years in the university, you know, who studied law, people who were called to the bar, 
you now ask the DSS guys to carry pencil and exercise book in front of the Federal High Court of Nigeria to be vetting lawyers to go to work. And he said, well, the security issue, I said, if it's a security issue, tell the DSS to set up one of their conference rooms mm. and look for a kangaroo judge to come and sentence in Namdika inside the place so that we know that you are not pretending about fairness. You are a party to the case already. You cannot be controlling what the other... What if his best lawyer is coming to court and DSS decide that he can't enter the courtroom? Just like they prevented me from, from yeah. entering and collected all my phones. That's also a public place. So we must make sure that all these issues are rectified when it comes to the fundamental human rights of Nigerians, that there is no limitation to it. And we have to keep expanding that frontiers. That's what uh, you saw on that day. And I think they quickly realized that uh, they messed up, and uh, some of them were congratulating Deji after uh, they had found... they were congratulating you too. Well, you know, they were congratulating us so that we could... Uh, <laughs> we, that, so that that trouble could end very quickly. It, it, yeah. you, you, you know why we said they were congratulating you as well? Because uh, generally, almost all the, 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 the print houses, the media houses, were hailing Deji and yourself as if uh, both of you have actually been called to ban in response to one of the tweets that we did see online. Someone said, for the fact that Deji has been called to ban, that means automatically... I attend uh, more court events in Nigeria than most lawyers <laughs> in the last five years. We always see uh, yeah, so I'm always in court. I, sometimes I go to court for cases that don't even have anything to do with me. You know? Why is that? Well, there are a lot of human rights cases that most people don't know about in Nigeria. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a lecturer from uh, the Southeast who was arrested because he was, he just, I think, wrote something about IPOB. And he's been in detention. He was not even in a regular detention. They took him to Wawa Barracks in Niger State. This is where they just arbitrarily dump people. And to make it worse, which most Nigerians don't know, judges are ferried from Abuja to go and carry out trials in Wawa Barracks. Not in the regular court, but federal high court judges. So that is how bad things have gotten. There is a girl whose father and mom also have, been, have disappeared in the last two years. Uh, we had to go to court on, uh, we had to work with Amnesty International for her. There's so many of those cases that I get invited to go attend to. And uh, sometimes when we show up in, uh, in court, the judges recognize and uh, they expedite some of those cases. Sometimes they don't care. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I go to uh, uh, courts, uh, I go to the courtrooms a lot. Sometimes I go to the courts to search for cases that are filed against me that I don't know about. Because they also do that. They go and file a lot of civil cases and they don't want to serve me. So I, I had plenty of time on my hands to <laughs> go and search the court's records to see if I have cases. Okay, so in, in terms of um, toying with human rights, I, I would like us to circle back to that. We've seen this play out a lot with security agencies on every cater. We see, for example, with the protests. Recently, we saw that they said, you know, even though they say your protest is a, it's a, it's a natural right that you have as a citizen, but before that, you will see, you know, cars parked and then with their vans and mm -hmm. the guns and everything, just in a subtle way trying to threaten you, you know. So we've seen a lot of security agencies play being God, like having that God complex, yeah. even down to security stops, you know, checking your cars, they mm. make you feel like if you misbehave, they just gun you down and then there's nothing you can do. What does that say about the um, impede, impeding freedom in the country and our judicial system as well? What is that? What is the perception that that gives? So there's general impunity in the country by security agencies and it's not limited to even you know, the federal security agencies. I don't know if you know about a few years ago when some of these Lagos security, they were set up by Lagos Lagos. They almost killed a guy at the toll gate. That was two years after NSAS because he was driving through and uh, they suspected that he wanted to participate in NSAS. Uh, that case was taken to court. I think he won. Uh, it was uh, in Ibehe that took that case up. This wasn't, it's one of these LSDPC, you know, I don't know what, Agency there. Yeah. You have uh, uh, what's it called? The traffic agencies, and all of them are the slightest provocation. They are willing to kill you, mm. even if the offense doesn't carry more than you know two hundred naira fine. Yeah. And you sometimes you've lost count of all the security agencies you have in the country, and that's why you see people were worried about state police. That even without state police, look at what our security agencies are doing. And if you look at the hierarchy, the army, for instance. 
they're involved in everything, including helping people to eject their tenants. Mm. Uh -huh. mm. The DSS is the same thing. Uh, you see army officials, I mean, uh, operatives on the street controlling traffic. These guys have no business yeah. in town. You, this, even these new ones, NSCDC, you know, the uh, civil defense are now carrying guns. They have joined it. At the slightest provocation, they are involved in violation of human rights. Mm. In all those states, when we were involved, which New Central covered a lot with uh, resume or resign for Akere Dolu, Amotekun arrested people who were pasting posters against Akere Dolu. They were detained for three days without food. They beat them up and then took them to the DSS. And the DSS detained them in Comunicado mm. for three days. So all of them, you know, this, this is impunity. And... In all honesty, our judicial system aids and abets this. Because if you go to court today and sue certain agencies of government, like the DSS or the police, judges are not likely to look your way. When I was shot with a riot gun by a police officer, I took her to court. The judge said she was doing her job, shooting me at close range. So we are still going on appeal now. But the truth is that even when you go on appeal, before you get a date for your case to be heard, it will be another two years. So... Justice delayed is justice uh, denied. But what people must do is rise up wherever they might find this culture of impunity. Rise up to really the same way we did. It's not as if we couldn't have let those guys go. But we are sending a message to every goon that's stationed outside. Sometimes houses of politicians, Mopo will come and beat you up because you are passing the person or taking a picture. And there's no law that says you can't take a picture of a house or a person on a public property. Even on private properties, as long as you don't trespass, you're entitled to take pictures. And then you add that to the era of social media yeah. and tech-driven conversation and interaction. At every slightest provocation, we want to take pictures. So we must expand our democratic fronts by ensuring that if a police officer is talking to you, you should be allowed to start recording him as soon as he starts talking to you. You see that most of the biggest cases of human rights violations that have been resolved recently were done because there's photographic yeah. and uh, evidence. video evidence of yeah. impunity. All right. Yes. Let, let, let's look at let's look at the um, the current situation, especially let's look at the um, the role politicians play in upholding the constitutional of uh, laws as well. Um, while we're celebrating um, a day on due as well, um, a former governor, uh, former minister of uh, transport. Talking about um, Wesley Amici, yes. was equally called to bar, and he said he needed in his in his statement. He explained why he, he wanted to be a lawyer. Um, do you think that if all politicians understand, not just knowing, but understand what the law says, it will be better for the citizens and of course the country? No, except politicians' characters change. You know, obtaining a law degree doesn't make you respect human rights. Look, some of the worst human rights violations in Nigeria during the military rule or era were carried out by civilians who were the attorney generals. Because there was never a time during military rule that the attorney general of the federation was a military guy. It's always civilians. They wrote some of the worst laws. Some of the decrees that were violating human rights, press freedom in the country were written by lawyers. You can quote me anyway, any day uh, about this. So obtain a degree. Uh, doesn't make you a better human being. Except you're a better human being before you obtain a law degree. And uh, I would imagine that uh, Amechi is not going to be doing pro bono cases. He's not going to be doing human rights law. He will still go back and line up and be getting fat uh, briefs, probably from the government or agencies, uh, you know. So I wish him luck. I heard it took him 19 years to get a law degree, by the way. So that's great resilience on his part. But finally, uh, he has one. But it's important that these guys are... Uh, they understand that human rights is inalienable, and uh, you don't have to be a lawyer to respect and protect human rights. You have to be a human being that believes that other people have rights. Yeah, but still on human rights, you, yeah. you talked about taking a stand as individuals, that is. But is it not discouraging that it looks as though the system is designed to work against the rights? You just said that if you take your case, it might take you two years. You know, sometimes you, just to get trial, your hearing, you would be locked up. In fact, a case that shouldn't last for more than two months, you'd be locked up for like two years. And then some of these people do not have that opportunity to have it recorded, to have this evidence. Yeah. And even though some people who have it recorded do not have 
that voice on social media. So they cry on social media and before you know, the issue dies down. So all of this can be discouraging for an average Nigerian because again, some people do not have that. Some people are ignorant of these things you just said. Some people don't know that you are allowed to actually take make videos. Yes. So if you're trying to make a video and they try to harass you, you just out of fear, they, they instill that fear in you that you shouldn't do that. So if Nigerian citizens are facing all of this, right, and human rights is still being violated, on a daily basis and they see that although like 10% of these cases are resolved but about 90% of people suffer for standing up for their rights where does that leave us well you see what was the biggest resistance against police brutality in Nigeria and SARS 2020 yeah. it was provoked by a video uh, recording that was taken in uh, Delta State so it has done great justice to the country uh, and I'll tell you that during NSAS and after NSAS, the police called itself to order. You know, they released a lot of innocent people. They tried to clean up their acts. You know, they got a lot of those officers fired, some transferred away. But because there was no proper follow-up, of course, so many of them are back to their own way of doing things. And I must also say to you that it's not all the time that you record that they let you get away with your recording. Mm -hmm. They're also very, very fast and ensuring that they get a copy of the recording. Yes. So it's always good to have a, a backup uh, system. Let your recording be back to the cloud. That's the way you set it up. Because the DSS collected my phone last two weeks when I went for Umnam Dekanus trial. And uh, they tried to delete it, but it didn't work because it was backed up to my wow. iCloud. So as soon as they gave me back my phones, I was able to use it. Even though I saw that they tried to mess with my phone, they were trying to actually uh, clone my phone. Mm. Within the period I seized my phone, they, they tried to clone one of my phones, not knowing that I knew about it. But, you know, I let them have their way. I have, uh, you know, because they stole two of my phones, three of my phones are still with them, and they haven't given it back to me, because, even after a court order said. That is part of what the impunity we are talking about. Mm. There's a court order. After five years in this country, after I was falsely arraigned and accused of all kinds of things, they went and discontinued their case. The judge made an explicit order that they should return my money, my phones to me. Till today, the DSS hasn't responded. So how can you have a country and expect the country to be governed appropriately when a majority of people are above the law, or some of the security agents are above the law, and the rest of us are beneath the law? Mm -hmm. That's the problem. That's where the impunity comes in. And until this is addressed, you can't have a just, fair, and egalitarian society. Mm. Big, 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 big challenge there. Yeah. Well, uh, time is well spent, but let's drop one more question, one last one, which we'd like you to indeed talk about. Um, some time here, you had mentioned um, about the dollar. Yes. And that's, that prophecy is indeed nearing its complete fulfillment. It's com it's, it, it was fulfilled. It's fulfilling, yeah. but it's nearing its complete. No, actually, it was fulfilled. <laughs> there was a day for an hour that mm. the dollar reached 2,000. 2,000, yeah. yes. And, and then, then back, it came back to 950. 950 yeah. And now they've gone to they've gone to start doing what they do, which is subsidizing the dollar. That's okay. why it's at 1,600 right. now. Finally, what's your take on the current situation economically? The economy, as I told you at that time, the economy has gone down the toilet. And I remember when I said, "You said, God forbid," you know. But that's the reality today because look at what used to be 1,000 naira uh, when we last spoke in December. It's, they are now 5,000 naira. Kind of things. Everything has gone up because our economy is highly dependent on our ability to generate forex because we don't produce. And when you are not producing and you don't have anything that goes internationally beyond just oil, uh, your currency uh, will become useless, especially because those people who are managing the economy also don't understand anything about economics except the template that is given to them by the World Bank and the IMF. These are the people controlling us. But you see countries where people have independent minds economically, uh, you see that they are doing well. You see countries like Egypt, you know, I hate the repression there. But recently they abandoned the dollar because they wanted to be trading in other currencies. Nigeria has such agreements with China to be trading in yuan, but because of our, our allegiance to uh, the Bretton Woods institutions, we haven't been able to get out of it because our people don't know what they are doing in the economic sector, especially in the uh, uh, microeconomic sector. Our monetary policy is uh, wonky. We're finding out that they just print Naira in Nigeria, 
uh, for the last eight years. They just have been printing trillions and trillions of naira. And then when you add that to corruption and shadiness that's involved in selling the dollar, mm -hmm. then you can get past what you are now. What I said, and I'll repeat any day, is that the moment the central bank officials in Nigeria are involved in selling dollar, dollar's price can never, never match would be what it should be. Because what they just do is pick up dollars, go and sell in the black market, make their money. So there's no incentive to even produce when you can make cheap, fast money. Yeah. I said somewhere, most of the children of rich people who are working at the central bank, they don't have a desk. They just have the capacity to come in with their security tax, you know, get involved in dollar transactions, make their money and close at 4 p.m. That's all they do. And you can quote me any day, anywhere. And you can ask me fairly when you find them. <laughs> I, I hope to find him, but I think you'll be closer to finding him because I'm expecting that you'll be in one of his court cases. Uh, to, I, to... I, I don't go to court for people like that, but uh, I usually do for people whose rights are violated. Okay. He was a violator of other people's rights. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. okay. I, th I think we're going to invite you back to really look at this Emifile's issue, especially when they return back to the court uh, sometime in May. Uh, I'm sure you're also aware of the latest um, you know, the signature forgery that's been... I mean, I don't know what the guy didn't do when he was, uh, when he was central bank governor. But the good news was that we were covering it. Uh, and I talked about it extensively. I said everything. But who paid attention until it was too late? Nobody. Great conversations we've had here this morning. Well, I want to say thank you so much, Amoyeshwari, for joining us uh, this morning.